Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? My name is Anthony Knight, and I'm the founder and president of the Bataan Foundation. And thanks for coming out and spending a little time with us this afternoon. I think you're going to enjoy uh, Rachel's presentation. Before we get started, though, I'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones. This is kind of loud. <laughs> I'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones. And also, the library has asked me to remind everyone in the audience that there's no eating in this, in this room. So I see some new faces, and just real briefly, for those who don't know, uh, we started the Bataan Foundation about four years ago now, and we've been actively engaged in programming for the last three. We started primarily to educate black boys about black history and culture, as well as to make them more aware of who they are as human beings and to help them figure out how to master challenging situations. My background, however, is in museum education. And so for me, it was equally important that we provide opportunities for not only the boys' families, but for those in the community to have opportunities to learn and engage with information that they may not uh, have access to. And so that's the genesis of creating these public uh, fora, so to speak. So hopefully you will enjoy what we're going to present today. And uh, I have said this before, and I will say it uh, probably forever. We have really benefited from what I call the kindness of strangers. Uh, I learned about Rachel uh, through an email I receive every week from the Gilder Lehrman Center up in Connecticut. And I saw she was doing this topic on uh, pro-slavery art. And I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. So as I normally do, I just shoot people random emails. They don't know me, I don't know them. But we've been fortunate. And a lot of the sh emails that I send, the random emails that I send, often are responded to by folks who are very interested in what we're doing and who want to help. So when I reached out to Rachel, she said, sure, I have a sister in Marietta. I can make it a weekend. So uh, it was very kind of her, and we really appreciate uh, her coming from Alabama here to Atlanta to share with you her research. She's working on a book. It's not yet done, but um, perhaps you'll be able to help her engage in, uh, with the information that she presents. So at the end of her talk, which is about 40, 45 minutes, um, please, if you will, come up, ask her questions, Engage. She's very interested in hearing your thoughts and engaging with you, so please do not disappoint her. Uh, let me just read a brief bio, and then we'll ask Rachel to come out and we'll get started. <coughs> Rachel Stevens is Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Alabama. During the spring semester of 2019, she served as a fellow at the Gilda Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. Her first book, Selling Andrew Jackson, Ralph E. W. Earl, and the Politics of Portraiture was released in 2018 by the University of South Carolina Press. Her talk today, The Family, Black and White, Pro-Slavery Visual Art and the Cult of Justification, comes from research on her current book project, Hidden in Plain Sight, Sight Slavery and the Suppression in Antebellum American Art. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Stevens to the program. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you to Anthony for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here, as he said, to have an excuse to visit my family this weekend. We've had a lovely time and um, also to be able to talk about this research. So. As Anthony mentioned, the, the information that I'll share with you today comes from this book project that I've um, been working on for the last several years. And um, I spent, as he also mentioned, the spring semester in New Haven, Connecticut at the Gilder Lehrman Center. And if that's not an institution that you're familiar with, it might be one that you're interested in kind of signing up for their newsletter because they really do wonderful work with specific, specifically their focuses on um, abolitionism and, 
and slavery, um, but they get wonderful scholarship and find really interesting things. So, so I'll direct you to their website if you're interested. And I was fortunate enough to serve as a fellow there, which basically meant having the time and space to sit and use library resources and think about this work and, and do research and allow it to evolve. So um, I, I want to thank Anthony for the invitation to come and to his foundation, the Bataan Foundation, and also to Auburn Avenue Research Library for hosting us today. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that despite the hours of reading and self-education that I've done um, and the empathy that I have, I do recognize that I speak from a privileged um, and necessarily outside position due solely to my whiteness. And I try to live with the constant reminder of this and to consider the material I'm approaching critically and with sympathy and empathy. Um, and I think it's important for art historians like myself, both um, no matter what the race, to study the visual ramifications of representations of slavery. And so that's what I'm attempting to do. Um, furthermore, a little bit of a trigger warning here just um, as you may have suspected, some of the images that I will show are incredibly racist and painful and difficult. Um, and um, we can talk through them together and I can talk about what they were intended to do and why I think it's important that we know about them today. Because for the most part, this stuff has been covered over and um, as a lot of very brilliant people before me have acknowledged, it's probably not very possible to move forward without acknowledging the past, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, like I said, I will speak for 40 or 45 minutes and show you lots of images and different, different approaches and themes I'm seeing coming out here, and then I'd love to have a conversation at the end if y'all are welcome, well, uh, willing to, to ask questions and chat. I invite that very much. A March 31st, 1954 letter seen here at the left from Claris S. Bingham, then director of the American Antiquarian Society addressed anonymously to the SIRS at Richmond's Confederate Museum, now called the American Civil War Museum, noted that an account book of Dickinson Hill and Company, a firm who the letter said, quote, dealt in slaves, um, seen here on the right, which had been found in Richmond among the rubble in the aftermath of the 1865 burning of the city had recently been donated to his society. Having no interest in the object, Bingham wrote in this letter that quote, I am sending it to you under separate cover. If you wish to keep it, please do so. Otherwise discard it. Um, and again, this is an account book of dealings in trading enslaved people. So the archivists and art historians and historians in us kind of gasp when we say, you don't want, see, don't throw it away if you don't want it, are you kidding me? Well, it was saved luckily and it's, it's here today um, at the Virginia Historical Society. But the systematic cover up or perhaps in some cases apathy to African American and slavery history demonstrated by this story extended from private families to cultural institutions who over the generations discarded or dismissed objects of interest related to enslaved, the history of enslaved people. As many of us are well aware, this is only one of the issues in approaching the study of the history of slavery. Suspicion at nearly every turn led to cover up and this manifested in disparate ways. A desire by abolitionists to suppress slavery led to cover up of historical truths about slavery by pro-slavery apologists. Cover up led to historical amnesia, and the record that remains has affected our ability to study these impacts. Today, it is impossible for most everyone to imagine a life lived under antebellum chattel slavery. The artists this project investigates similarly did not experience the hardship themselves. However, the illustra they illustrated their understanding of it to suit their beliefs or purposes or those of their patrons or collectors um, represented in this story. Works and actions such as these mediate our view of slavery today. And I'll say more about the concept of loyal slaves represented in this watercolor by Augustus Kolner later. Stephen Best describes a quote, temporal de deferral as being what makes historical erasures historical, describing how any approach to slavery's visual record must always be arrived at by proxy. 
So my goal here, therefore, is not to probe the difficulties of slavery, but rather to locate and acknowledge the absences, engage how a visual culture of cover-up affected the political climate and continues to cloud our view today. The research collected here, therefore, works together to illuminate what I have found to be some little acknowledged trends within slavery-related artwork. Suspicion, secrecy, and silence became visualized between about 1830 and 1865, particularly with regard to pro-slavery sympathizers. These advocates were responding directly to abolitionists' widespread and organized application of art and visual culture. And for illustration purposes only, I show you a couple of images here that are on opposite ends of the visual spectrum. On the right, you see a romanticized view of George Washington's Mount Vernon with um, a so-called mammy figure playing on the ground with his stepson. You can see them here. Um, this is a, an Im the type of image that made slavery look like a rosy picture, painted a romanticized idea of it, and was very typical by these pro-slavery apologists that I'm talking about. The image on the left is an anti-slavery work. Um, what, what you're looking at, called The Price of Blood, is a work um, by an artist named Thomas Satterwhite Noble. He was an anti-slavery artist. And we see a father who has a child with an enslaved woman that he owns that he is selling because he can legally do that. So the price of blood here. Artists who supported the South vigorously responded to attacks on slavery by abolitionists. They did this using both the written and spoken word as well as visual art. However, probably because slavery is unjustifiable, pro-slavery sympathizers weren't nearly as organized and strategic in their responses and justifications as were the abolitionists. And their work took a scattershot form. It was haphazard and a bit disorganized and I think that relates to the unjustifiability of the institution of slavery. Most often these works, however, paint a rosy view of life under slavery, and some plantation museums today continue to paint this romanticized story, but this all began long before emancipation. Despite a profusion of historical interest and in scholarship on the antebellum South, much less attention has been given to the arts of the region, a woman named Drew Gilpin Faust, who has written on this painting, which I'll come back to in a, a, a bit later, is a rare Southern historian who recognizes the significance of the visual arts in conjunction with political and social history. As she notes, quote, historians have routinely privileged the written word over pictorial or sculptural representation. And those examining the South have been reinf reinforced in this proclivity by the assumption that the region has never been an important locus of achievement in visual arts. We don't hear a lot about historic, historic Southern visual art, generally. As Faust says, examples of Southern art do still constitute significant cultural artifacts that offer important insights into the civilization that, that um, produced them. So taking my cue from Faust's notions, my project seeks to recover those so-called significant cultural artifacts, placing them at the center of a mobilized force of justification, cover-up, and silence regarding slavery in the antebellum period that responded directly to abolitionist efforts. Although I strive to put enslaved individuals at the center of this project, because slavery attempted to strip them of their agency and humanity, using artistic resources that were made during the antebellum period and often by their oppressors to recover those ideals proves really problematic. Abolitionist art tended to focus on the violence that was enacted on enslaved people. Pro-slavery art is almost always a farce. So despite this, I continue to work to locate the buried individual through various means. And I also draw parallels between cover up of the realities of slavery by these pro-slavery sympathizers and the attempted suppression of the humanity of the enslaved people and with the enslaved people's own often hidden culture and humanity. And ultimately to the cover up which resulted in archival absence that challenges historical recovery. 
so obviously there are major issues with a body of work that was produced to encourage and support the enslavement of human beings in America. The images, like I've said, are painful and misguided and evil and often difficult to look at or consider, but they've also been ignored and covered up for generations. And as Faust says, quote, by understanding how others have fashioned and maintained their own systems of meaning, we shall be better equipped to evaluate, criticize, and perhaps even change our own. And I ask how we can learn from the past if we don't know about it. So abolitionist art, art that was working to abolish slavery, took on a variety of common trends, namely whipping scenes, slave sales, and I'll show you an example of one of those scenes here, and mothers being separated from their children. You've probably seen scenes, scenes like this before. There were facts about slavery, however, which even the staunchest abolitionist may have considered too extreme to represent, and thus artists and patrons self-censored. I'm interested in what was shown and also what wasn't shown. And one example of that is this really problematic and painful image called the early development of Southern chivalry. So this is a watercolor by an artist named David Claypool Johnston. And it places a whipping scene, which was not uncommon, in a parlor of an upper class elite, planter elite Southern antebellum home. And it illustrates planter children enacting the violence on a doll. Now, abolitionist whipping scenes were common, as I've mentioned. They were often staged outside, however, against enslaved men and rarely featured little girls. And it was probably the presence of the children participating in this violence that caused the artist David Claypool Johnston, and I just show you a, a typical whipping scene here, problematic in other ways. Um, but David Claypool Johnston censored this work. Despite producing lots of anti-slavery prints, Johnston never completed this watercolor as a print. So his typical method was to create an original watercolor. This one's an original watercolor. It's in gray tones, black and white. And then to produce prints after them, based on them, that could be distributed by the hundreds. But he never did that with this particular image. And I think because of the, something about the sensitivity of the way he depicted this caused him to self-censor. On the opposite end of the spectrum, and he was an abolitionist artist, Johnston was, but much pro-slavery art responded directly to those painful and powerful images um, like Johnston's. One tactic, as seen here, was to illustrate the civilizing influence that slavery might have on a person of African descent. Despite the ubiquity of whipping scenes in anti-slavery artworks, pro-slavery images never alluded to the common practice. Such violence would have directly contradicted arguments about the so-called positive good notion of slavery that these promoters were trying to um, get across. Thus, pro-slavery rhetoric and artwork sought to conceal the violence of slavery. So we see this so-called civilizing influence illustrated in this work. Suspicion of abolitionists, suspicion of the North and of enslaved people themselves led to this, what I see as this extensive Southern cover-up, and this extended to the visual culture in interesting ways. Idealizing or justifying slavery, like this work does, I would argue, was by far the most common tactic and widespread form of pro-slavery visual culture. Pro-South apologists applied a range of justifications for slavery, and visual production aligned with these ideas during the antebellum period and war years. The overarching trend, as I've said, is the idealization of slavery, making the institution look good, which I see as a form of cover up, cover up, covering the harsh reality of living an unfree life and covering the enslaved people's humanity. Putting a positive spin on the institution and thereby shielding the horrors of enslavement served as a significant goal of much of the pro-slavery work and this reflected the pro-slavery rhetoric. Within paintings that address the plantation South, racial dynamics actually took a wide range of forms depending on the intended message. According to historian Catherine Clinton, who has written um, the history of the plantation mistress, she said, planters sentimentalized to the point of caricature 
the image of happy darkies singing in the fields, end quote. As a result, the painters who worked for these planters provided visual reference to these ideas. Cover-up also extended to omitting enslaved people from artwork altogether, even when the artwork featured plantations upon which hundreds of enslaved people worked and lived. Nell Painter urges us to, quote, look beneath the gorgeous surface of the world that slave defenders created and to pursue the hidden truths of slavery. The gorgeous surface extends to painted representations like this watercolor by Charles Fraser, which idealized Southern slavery. Planters regularly wrote about the happiness of the enslaved people they owned, and many clung to George Frederick Holmes's ideas, for example, that slavery was, quote, an institution natural, just, and righteous, beneficial to both the master and slave, but more especially the latter, end quote. The artwork associated with slaveholding places its focus almost entirely on the slave owner. This reflects the hierarchical nature of slaveholding society and those at the top clung to the social order. The focus on the owner also reflects the rhetoric which emphasized the duties of the master to care for the enslaved person and the morality in doing this. When slavery defenders turned to visual culture and the fine arts, the institution was usually represented as being a natural aspect of Southern living and even a mutually beneficial enterprise. Slaves were most often omitted from these scenes altogether, which usually celebrated the splendid nature of the planter's home, the supposedly splendid nature, and the grounds and ignored the root of that physical beauty. Most planters commissioned paintings of their estates, and most commonly the focus on these, of these images was on the big house and at times on the vast nature of the planter's estate. This was certainly the case in this magisterial painting of Adelicia and Joseph Ackland's Belmont estate in Nashville, Tennessee. Little is known about this painting, which was found in an attic in Washington, D.C. in 1961, but it was clearly intended as a celebratory view of the city residence of one of the wealthiest families in the South. And if you visit Nashville, you can still visit Belmont Mansion today, and the house in the center here is, is Belmont Mansion. The grounds now are mostly turned into Belmont University now, and that's on the west end of Nashville. Anyway, as of 1860, the Acklands, who owned Belmont Mansion, owned 691 enslaved people. Um, most of them worked on their Louisiana plantations, but 32 of them lived and labored on the site that's represented here. Um, reference is made to slavery here, um, although very minimally. Two of the ten slave quarters, which were destroyed in 1890, appear visible um, barely in the background beyond the octagonal bathhouse. There's the bathhouse here, and there's a couple of quarters here. Furthermore, a presumably enslaved man peeks out of the vineyard in the foreground with grapes in his hand, so alluding to the work he was doing here. When landscape paintings like these do include enslaved people, they are often idle, not shown at work, as seen here in this watercolor by Adrian Persak, or when they are represented at work, they are tiny, um, almost subsidiary characters in, an envi in, in a lush environment, as in this Virginia scene by Edward Byer. So the enslaved people here who are bending over at work, you know, almost blend in to the haystacks here. Another common form of slave justification included promoting the idea of African Americans as ignorant or childlike. And images like Charles Vaughn's painting here, Sunday Morning in the Kitchen, were created to project these ideas. So the grown and enslaved men are represented as childlike and playful and likened to the children that they are pictured with um, in the room. They are also represented as part of the family. So refer referencing Sunday Morning, alludes to the white adult members of the household being away attending church while the others were left to play together. The men are also shown as having a certain amount of freedom at leisure and without strict oversight and within a pleasant, loving, and familial environment. And I can only imagine the conversation that must, must have taken place between the painter here and the owner or the, the uh, master of this household. Um, he was a very wealthy doctor in Kentucky and um, 
how that might have played out and what the intended message would have been here. But I think this painting very clearly was intended to justify slavery while showing us the pro-slavery beliefs of the owner and the patron. Paintings like Sunday Morning in the Kitchen seek to suppress the harsh reality of life under slavery and put a positive spin on it. And like the verbal justifications presented by those who supported the institution, they followed the wide variety of piecemeal justifications of slavery, all of which worked to promote slavery while undermining the individual enslaved person. Portraits also worked within the decorative environment of the so-called big house on the plantation and could simultaneously communicate racially charged messages about the slave owning families that occupied them. For example, when the prolific silhouette artist named Auguste Edouard, whose work we see here, visited New Orleans in 1844, he was commissioned by the slave owner Robert Young of Natchez, Mississippi to make a number of black paper portraits of seven of his family members, in addition to three enslaved people, two of whom were identified in his records as Henrietta and William. Excuse me. Of the several portraits Edward produced for the young family, the largest, which you see here, represents a group scene within a family parlor. The work entitled The Robert Young Family of Natchez, Mississippi, is a large cut paper piece on sepia with watercolor mounted on fabric. So it's basically cut paper with watercolor and the paper is mounted on a piece, everything's mounted on a piece of fabric. A delicate piece that's quite large. Um, the parlor setting features a, features a painted floor with a decorative curtain behind, a piano on the left, and an ornate fireplace mantle on the right. All of these were common inclusions in planter elite parlors of the period. The adult female figure in the center who holds the baby outward, right here, presumably towards its mother, is certainly an enslaved woman. Perhaps she is Henrietta. Her duty as caretaker for the young child she holds, her distinctive tignon or head wrap, as well as her long apron and kerchief help signify her status. The appearance of an enslaved woman among the family in the parlor offers another version of visual imagery being used in support of that pro-slavery rhetoric. Enslaved people in the big house were part of the everyday lives of the white owner's family, and often the family reassured themselves that the enslaved people were happy, satisfied with their situation, and the pro-slavery supporters touted such ideas, even including them in so-called family portraits like we see here. In addition to the enslaved woman at the center of the silhouette, it is possible but the, that the small boy at the far right of the scene is also enslaved. The tight wavy texture of his hair could indicate African American heritage. Perhaps he was the playmate of the young toddler before him who pretends to ride his hobby horse with an outstretched whip rising above it. The whip takes on perhaps unintended but loaded meaning within the context of the family's slave ownership. Although these were common toys of 19th century children, the inclusion of a whip directly before the in, uh, um, enslaved boy directly reflects the Southern racial hierarchy already impacting these young boys' individual lives. Pro-slavery justifications also extended beyond visual culture into sculpture and material culture as well. One intriguing example of this, and these can be seen regularly in cemeteries across the South, but here was an 1853 gravestone from Eufaula, Alabama. And while it was uncommon for enslaved men and women to receive formal tombstones, the owner of a man named Lewis Porter went beyond the typical burial here. He made or commissioned Porter's tombstone, which reads on one side, which you see here, sacred to the memory of Lewis Porter, who died January 10, 1853, aged about 38 years. But the reverse of the gravestone reads the following. The plantation owners of Barber County, Alabama, held their slaves in high esteem, as is proved in the tombstone above, erected by Major Porter over the grave of his slave, Lewis Porter, who died in 1853. Now, while it could possibly be the case that Barber County slaves were indeed held in high esteem, the statement would seem unnecessary if it was indeed true. Rather, it seems that Porter's owner wished to project this idea, just like the commissioners of the other visual paintings that I've shown you did, and he understood that there's not 
any more powerful tool of communication than the tangible or visible, visible object. A specific subgenre of pro-slavery icons exists in the form of photographs of enslaved nannies with the white children of their owners who they reared. Potentially hundreds of examples of these complicated works exist. You've probably encountered them somewhere before, and they touch on a wide variety of issues and possibilities. Historians Dora Appel and Sean Michelle Smith have considered the ways that white supremacists bolstered their power by circulating lynching photographs, but the use of photography to support white supremacy did not actually begin after the Civil War, and I would argue that it ex extends far back to 1839 and the invention of photography. Myth-making appeared commonly in these photographs, which participate in an overt masking of the reality of enslaved women's lives. The appearance of a type of mother and child composition references the idea of a shared bond and a mutually beneficial relationship that supporters of slavery touted. Like much of the imagery produced by slavery apologists, however, these photographs purposely mask the harsh realities of enslavement. The photographs represented supporters an almost biblical facade of familial comfort, couched in the form of an iconic composition, that of the mother and child, as a direct alternative to abolitionist views of the anti-Christian violence under slavery. Furthermore, because 19th century sitters considered photography to be a truth-telling medium, its application in this way attempts to <coughs> underscore slavery justifications while presenting an alternative form of Southern family portraiture. With an enslaved woman appearing as a surrogate mother and a comfortable baby in her arms, these photographs justify the idea of slavery as being all in the family. Family daguerreotypes, an early form of photograph, were displayed in the home and later cartes de visite, um, which were smaller kind of cardboard photographs around the Civil War period, were gathered together in albums. So purposeful images like this were included among the multitudes of other so-called family photographs. This daguerreotype of Ellen Sherwood with the baby Bradford Harrison is a typical example. The daguerreotype of baby Bradford's parents, Jonathan and Caroline Harrison, is contained within the same case as the child and the nanny, creating the illusion of a unified family unit. Abolitionist efforts that focus on the separation of families through the internal slave trade inspired slave owners to promulgate messages of happy familial situations in these photographs. Antebellum correspondence of slave owners regularly references the notions of one so-called family black and white. Um, and another pair references the idea that these were staged photographs. Here you see Matilda Boyd, the white grandmother of Courtney Cogbill, and she appeared in this photograph on the same day that baby Courtney also appeared with an unidentified enslaved woman. So at their core, I believe that these images were, um, were staged and intended as another form of slave justification meant to construct slavery as a benevolent regime. At the same time, however, I'm very grateful for these images because in sitting for their photographs, which was a rare occurrence for an enslaved person in bondage, we have for posterity's sake a rare sake, a rare remnant of their humanity and a record of the role, one of the roles they played in their individual lives. An especially virulent group of pro-slavery artists in Richmond, Virginia, united in the years of the Confederacy to target their work in support of slavery. Most of them were Virginians, and most of them also volunteered for Confederate service, going on to use their work years after in support of the lost cause mythology that developed in the wake of the Civil War. Much of their work, however, promoted the idea of loyalty by enslaved people as proof of the benevolence of slavery. The so-called loyal slave became very commonly represented in the art. William Ludwell Shepard's work that you see here I Carried Him Home, Master Charlie, is a typical illustration and represents the romantic, fictionalized image of the loyal slave. With Master Charlie's son mortally wounded in battle and his knapsack, canteen, and weapon abandoned on the ground behind him, 
his supposedly ever loyal and devoted enslaved man carries his body home for the last time. Perhaps the most significant painting that celebrated the concept of the loyal slave and one which became very famous in the South and a Confederate icon in the years after the war was this painting, William D. Washington's The Burial of Latin A. The work and the lore that grew around it touch on many facets of Confederate ideology and practice down to the story of the blue shawl that you see in the center foreground, um, having supposedly been illegally imported from England in a blockade runner. This large work promotes perhaps better than any other work the justification of the loyal slave idea. Among many messages, it reflects the idea of slaves being content in their situation, willing to assist when needed, loyal to the cause, and part of the family unit. The work was painted in Richmond in the summer of 1864 and illustrates the burial service for a young cavalryman. So here you see the coffin of William Latinay. Captain William Latinay was the only Confederate soldier killed during Jeb Stuart's famous ride around McClellan in Richmond in the so-called Peninsula Campaign during the Civil War, June of 1862. His brother John, a lieutenant in the same Virginia Cavalry Company, um, mourned over his body, um, shot in the midst of battle, but the unit had to keep moving. So when a cart operated by an enslaved man known to history as Uncle Aaron, who was owned by a neighbor, the neighboring Newton family of Westwood, passed by, John Latney commandeered the enslaved man in the cart and asked them to carry his brother's body back to his plantation for proper burial because he had to keep going. So although the white men who lived there were away at war, the mistress of the house, Mrs. Brockenbro, there's a lot, of, a lot of characters in the story, but it's a true story, illustrated here later, promised to provide a Christian burial for the dead soldier. And according to the story, so-called loyal slaves cleaned the body, prepared it for burial, built the casket, and stood watch over it uh, through the night as battle raged on. Without the availability of a trained minister who was supposedly detained across Union lines after being sent for by the enslaved man Aaron, the woman made the sacrifice of performing the service. And so that's what we see here, a woman taking on a masculine role um, out of devotion to the cause um, and performing the burial service when a minister couldn't become available. So we see her here women and children and enslaved people all together separated by the coffin of course but here mourning this soldier's body together people in the south loved this painting because it gave mothers whose white sons were fighting in the confederacy um, and in a way some sense of of um, comfort knowing that maybe they would also receive a christian burial if they if they died in battle so the Latinay family was one of the oldest and most elite in Virginia, and here is an image of the 29-year-old Latinay, um, who was himself a, quote, ardent secessionist and, quote, thoroughly Virginian in all his feelings. His family owned more than 200 enslaved people at the time of the war, and the, his death and the circumstances of it were quickly reported in the Richmond press, and they inspired first a poem by John Reuben Thompson, and then Washington's painting. The poem was published in a Confederate um, literary magazine called The Southern Literary Messenger, of which Thompson, who wrote the poem, was the owner. And subsequently, it was distributed as, as a broadside, like a flyer, in Richmond, Virginia. Thompson, the author, was an ardent supporter of the South who had written that he doubted, quote, the capacity of the black race for intellectual improvement. So we get a sense of where he was coming from. And he used his magazine, as he said, as a, quote, guardian of Southern rights and interests to defend those when they are made the object of ruthless assault. Um, Thompson thus intended his publication to serve the same purpose as Washington's painting, and that is in defense and celebration of the South. And read. Um, the maintenance of the institution of slavery. The enslaved man in the foreground here represents Uncle Aaron, and he has removed his hat, rests his arm on a shovel with, with which he has presumably just finished digging the burial hole. And the entire so-called family mourns together 
represented as being united in their sympathy as the plantation mistress delivers the eulogy. With his prominent inclusion in the painting, as well as in the narrative and the dramatically unfolding story, Aaron is cast as somewhat of a hero. He drove the cart that carried Latine's body back to Westwood, he tried to retain a minister, and he was featured in both the painting and the poem. Therefore, although the work clearly represents the idea of the loyal slave, it was intended to specifically to symbolize the so-called deep devotion of men like Aaron to their owners. Now, as I've said, much of this pro-slavery art is produced in direct response to abolitionist or anti-slavery art. And I think that Washington's painting may have been inspired, uh, Washington may have been inspired to include a black enslaved man leaning on the painting's left-hand side by his former colleague who he broke with over the Civil War, Eastman Johnson's figure on the left side of his famous painting called Negro Life at the South. This, uh, the large version of this work is at the New York Historical Society, but there's a smaller copy that Johnson made that's at the High Museum and it's regularly on display. So some of you may recognize it from there. If we look at Aaron here and an unidentified enslaved man on the left here, I think you can see that they strike nearly identical poses and wear similar clothing with the addition of a vest on Aaron. Aaron also leans on a shovel rather than a table, but the arrangement of their respective legs is nearly identical. Further similarities between the paintings abound. For example, in each painting, a group of men, women, and children gather variously throughout the foreground. However, Washington's painting on the right contrasts the claustrophobic and dilapidated conditions of Johnson's painting with a lush, inviting, and green setting unmarred by any concerns greater than the dedication and burial and the sympathy of the family toward Latine, who represented all fallen Confederate soldiers. Although separated behind the coffin, the enslaved people are represented as being a significant inclusion within the broader scope of the plantation life, leading us back to that idea of the so-called family black and white. Um, in Johnson's work on the left, the African Americans are collectively cast as separate distinguished within the walled off space behind the house of their owners. And this was the owner's home here and the slave quarters behind and the setting was Washington DC for this particular work. And it was painted when slavery was still legal in DC. The compositional void of the fireplace on the left is replaced by, Johnson, by Washington's burial hole on the right. Washington also replaced Johnson's mossy roof line on the left with a lush green tree line on the right. I believe that, these, that Washington's painting on the right is a direct response to Johnson's abolitionist work because these two men were very well known to each other and Washington had been in, in Johnson's studio when he was working on his anti-slavery painting on the left. Furthermore, the paintings are nearly identical in size. Latine is 38 by 48 inches and Negro Life of the South is 37 by 46 inches. So these compositional parallels are too close to be accidental, and instead I believe that Washington intended the burial of Latine as a southern response, as a pro-slavery response to Johnston's painting, and by extension his anti-slavery views and abolition generally. It thus functions alongside other sympathetic slavery works that responded to abolitionist art by presenting a rosy view of slavery. In addition to the project of justifying slavery undertaken by pro-slavery advocates, other forms of cover-up emerged, and I'll take us quickly through some of those. Some of the most intriguing works were those that were hidden away, covered up, or never completed. Slave owners attempted to keep much about their actual lifestyle and dealings with their enslaved people under wraps, and this extended to the visual culture and the artistic representations. The anti-slavery English artist, Air Crow, whose sketch you see here, was removed from a Richmond slave sale for sketching what he saw. Purchasers and auctioneers viewed sketching at a trade with suspicion and prohibited it. He was actually dragged out by his pants for sketching um, the scene that he saw before him and that he ultimately captured because he was suspected of being anti-slavery, and he certainly was. When he went back to England, he completed a painting based on this work. 
probably for similar reasons as well as the limitations of photographic technology, vers virtually no photographic representations exist which document the slave trade. One rare exception to this, and it's kind of hard to make out what's going on here, may be this photograph allegedly representing the so-called last slave sale at Cheapside in Lexington. Although relatively nothing is known about this image's origins, the scene appears to represent a sale before the courthouse in Lexington, and these were known to take place there. And you see what perhaps what might be an um, auctioneer here at center. And instead, instead of views that expose slavery's reality, however, enslaved people were represented time and again as loyal, familial, ignorant, and thus suited for their bondage as a way to justify the maintenance of the institution. Furthermore, the significance of artwork to underscore a pro-Southern message was revealed by the ways that the South and Southerners and ultimately the Confederate government um, went to protect and conceal certain works of art. They recognized that art was not neutral and they mobilized it in defense of the Southern cause. William D. Washington's painting, landscape painting called Heroes of the Valley that you see here, for instance, was one of many paintings that was sequestered throughout the South to save it from destruction by the Union. The painting was particularly prized by Confederate President Jefferson Davis and it hung in the Confederate White House during the war. Before Davis fled Richmond at the end of the war, a colleague named John Davies offered to take some of his art collection to a place where, quote, they would never be found by a Yankee. He took Frederick Valk's bust of Davis and the, quote, painting of the heroes of the valley and removed both after dark. And here in the, this is an, a terrible iPhone snapshot of, uh, that I took in January in the Confederate White House in Richmond, but you can see they've both been recovered. The Heroes of the Valley painting actually hangs right beside that bust by Volk. Um, they were found many years later buried in a box in the yard of what had been Davy's home. And this story illustrates just one of the many ways that suspicion, in this case with regard to Union destruction, affected the artistic realm. Among slave owners, privacy and silence regarding slavery prevailed, and it appears couched in suspicion and secrecy in the archival record even. Basil Manley, who was the pro-South, pro-slavery antebellum president at the University of Alabama, and who owned about 40 enslaved people and purchased and rented additional individuals on behalf of the university, even took to writing parts of his diary in code. And I've marked those here for you. I don't know what they mean, but he was covering something up. In some cases, Southern artists were so suspicious and their work so incendiary that they shrouded it in secrecy. The work of Adelbert John Valk, whose photograph you see here, exemplifies the secrecy in the visual arts with regard to slavery justification and hatred by a hatred of abolitionists. And by the way, Valk's brother, Frederick, is the Richmond sculptor of the Davis bust, and Valk, both Valks were actually in cahoots with that pro-Confederate Richmond circle that I described earlier. Valk established his practice, um, his printmaking practice in Baltimore. He was originally from Germany, and he worked his day job, he worked as a dentist, and he made his prints at night. He used them to espouse his support of the Southern cause, and during the war, he covertly served the Confederacy in many ways, including as a blockade runner, a smuggler of medical supplies to the South from the North, Baltimore was, was Union occupied, a keeper of a safe house for Confederates, a spy, a personal courier for Jefferson Davis, among other things. Valk himself admitted quite proudly later in life that his was dangerous work, which resulted in frequent arrests. He was a Confederate working in Union territory, so he had to work in secret. Valk utilized his pro graphic pro propaganda, and I'm not sure if you can see this one very well, but it's Abraham Lincoln writing the Emancipation pro Proclamation with lots, lots of um, anti-Christian and devilish references throughout, particularly the, that little devil that sits on the table before him. So this is graphic propaganda that Valk used to counteract what he said were the lying litanies of Southern brutality that he saw illustrated in the Union press. 
um, he was responding directly to Thomas Nast's work in particular, if you know that, that pro-union artist. Valk himself cited his work as a response to Nast, admitting in a letter decades later that, quote, the production of these etchings suggested itself to my mind on seeing the illustrated papers of the North filled with one-sided pictures of the war and with villainous caricatures, such, for instance, as those of the nastiest caricatures, the notorious Nast. And I thought it a pity that no pictorial record should issue from the South. So he worked to villainize abolitionists as well as Union soldiers and leaders to belittle African Americans and to celebrate Southern sympathizers. For example, lobbying the biggest insult he could think of at the abolitionist preacher Henry Ward Beecher, he cast him as an African American man who he labeled Brother Beecher. He also portrayed Lincoln in blackface multiple times. He also regularly engaged with and alluded to other works of American art, often playing satirically upon them. So just quickly, I'll show you his work crossing the Potomac to join the Southern Army, in which I believe he was responding to a fellow German artist named Emanuel Leutze's iconic 1851 painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware. You've probably seen this one illustrated before. Valk, however, created his work in secret. While Leutze was creating his to be painted as a, as a mural in the US Capitol building, Leutze's, um, and Leutze's work was produced as a patriotic acknowledgement of Washington's revolutionary heroics, Valk's work here celebrates a divide in the country, champions the Marylanders who decided to leave their home state and join the Confederacy, and it's their trip over to the Confederacy that he celebrates. Valk's original series of 10 prints was probably first issued in 1862 in what he called V. Blatta's War Sketches, and V. Blatta was his, his pseudonym because he worked in secrecy. They were also known as the Sketches of the Civil War in North America. And about half of those initial 10 images represented pro-South themes, such as this print, Slaves Protecting Their Master from the Enemy, which was sketched in 1861. The scene depicts an orderly and well-fed household in which an enslaved woman at the door misleads Union troops as to the whereabouts of her owner, um, who she covers for as he hides behind the door with his pistol in hand. This print marks another early example in the war of artwork promoting the idea of the loyal slave. Valk shrouded his involvement in pro-slavery printmaking by taking orders in secrecy during the Civil War by using that pseudonym V. Blatta, um, and in addition, after creating the sketches and etching plates for his series of works, they were shipped to London for safe printing because they were found so incendiary in the United States he couldn't find anybody to do the printing, at least in the Union, which is where he lived. For slavery apologists, hatred for abolitionists often extended into the realm of destruction. Postmasters often censored abolitionist materials and state governments banned mail carriers in the South from distributing them. The first direct mailing of materials from the American Anti-Slavery Society to the South in 1835 ended up being burned in the dark of night in South Carolina as this image illustrates. In addition, enslaved people were banned from possessing anti-slavery materials which speaks to the fear of these images' influence and their potential for powerful action. In another small-scale act of iconoclasm, The Liberator, which was an anti-slavery publication, reported that a pro-slavery man had purchased a copy of this widely circulated um, photograph of the scourge back, which is what it became known as, and tore it to shreds, believing that his was the only copy. Destruction of abolitionist work became a common tactic for slavery supporters. For example, the images of Pennsylvania Hall, and I'll show you three of them, reveal how destruction became a hallmark of the art of slavery. Also known as Abolitionist Hall, the commanding building had been constructed as a place to discuss and combat slavery, but it was destroyed by mob fire in Philadelphia after only four days of operation. In a climate of growing hostilities, the interracial ceremonies and the events associated with the building's opening angered Philadelphia slavery sympathizers. The small mezzo tent engraving entitled Destruction of the Hall noted at the bottom, that's what you see here, that it was drawn from the spot and engraved by Jay Sartain. And John Sartain was a well-known printmaker and abolitionist in Philadelphia. 
This depicts the monumental structure engulfed in flames as crowds look on, revelers celebrate, and fire companies work to save the adjoining building, but not the hall itself. The dark and dramatic nighttime scene cast the act of destruction as shameful, and this print was produced to raise funds for the abolition of cause in Philadelphia. However, in typical response, slavery sympathizers and anti-abolitionists responded to those um, sympathetic prints and took pride in the building's destruction, which they caused, and saw it as a fitting consequence of the interracial activities that were taking place there. They responded by producing this print of their own entitled Abolitionist Hall, with a longer title, um, which was noted to have been drawn on stone by Zip Coon, who was the minstrelsy dandy character who mocked free blacks. In addition, or in the racist anti-abolition cartoon, Pennsylvania Hall has been converted into an interracial brothel by the second anti-slavery convention of American women who were holding their meeting in Philadelphia at the time of its destruction. The print depicts a series of well-dressed dandies, over-sexualized black and interracial groups of adults and children, casting them as a ridiculous but threatening lot and illustrating concern over the concept of the uppity black that anti-abolitionists feared would gain power as a result of emancipation. The use of arson and violence in attempt to silence the abolitionist cause was all too common, and the destruction of Pennsylvania Hall represented a horrendous act by a racist mob. Erasure, removal, censorship, and cover-up dominated pro-slavery supporters' reactions to the slavery debate, and perhaps no act made a bigger statement than the burning of, abolitionist, of the abolitionist structure. These prints offer tangible examples of how pro-slavery forces were responding directly to abolitionist artistic efforts and how both sides use art to capitalize on the events for their respective causes benefit. As a postscript to Southern destruction, the journals of Richmond sculptor Edward Valentine represent a post-war attempt to control memory and legacy with regard to slavery. His biography reveals that, quote, he has kept his diary without omission of a single day for over 50 years. That's remarkable in itself. But these notebooks are impossible to read in full today. Although racism was the rule among his circle, and he was one of the um, pro-Confederate Richmond cohort that I described earlier, um, by the end of his life in the early 20th century, Valentine felt compelled to hide his extreme views from posterity his will ordered that his decades-long series of diaries should be destroyed, but his family wanted to preserve them, and a court battle ensued. As a result of the court battle, the court ruled that every page of every book should be cut in half lengthwise and one half of the page destroyed. <laughs> Today, only half of every page in this box exists, so this is a nightmare for researchers, right? Ultimately, what does knowledge about how visual culture of slavery was complicit in advancing the Confederate cause do for us? It complicates the history of the South and further deepens, let me try that again. It complicates the history of the South further and deepens the reach of the history of art. Awareness of how some artists were responding to pro-union, anti-slavery art allows us to broaden the story of American art. It also extends the reach of pro-slavery rhetoric into the visual realm, revealing extensive measures that slave owners took to preserve the institution. It ultimately reveals a truly ugly side of the history of art, and I hope shows how interdisciplin interdisciplinary scholarship of this nature can contribute to humanitarian study. But it also places the history of, of art at the center of the American experience, revealing how this type of study might help to recognize the critical role art played across history and culture and politics. Thank you so much. Or if you want to project from your seat, I can probably hear you and repeat the question too if you don't want to come up. Mm 
Thank you so much for that question, and I'll repeat it just for Facebook Live because we're streaming this, but, um, and just in case everybody didn't hear. Um, but the question basically is, how is this antebellum work? How, how are we seeing it being perpetuated throughout time and into the present today? Um, and you made a really wonderful comparison with The Handmaid's Tale, and I haven't jumped on that bandwagon yet, but I intend to with, um, sort of propaganda, propaganda being used to, um, in, in this case, to um, illustrate one of the so-called benefits of enslavement. And, and this is, I didn't say much about the biblical defense, as, as they put it here, of slavery, but the Christianizing influence of the white owners was one, another one that was regularly used in pro-slavery rhetoric to um, describe one of the so-called benefits, and y'all are probably familiar with this. So the question is a big one, which is how did this continue? Um, but it's a very important one, because as you recognize, um, once emancipation hit, once the Civil War ended and slavery was legally over, um, slavery took on a, a, a same form, different name, and the same thing continued with this work. So all of this work that I'm finding from pre-1865 um, looks remarkably similar to the same types of images that we see in the 1880s and 1890s during um, re uh, post-Reconstruction, um, Jim Crow South, and up until the Civil Rights period. So I, uh, it's really been eye-opening to see that the line of racism in American art extended way back to the beginnings and continues today. And I've got a, a sort of embarrassing example of the way that these, particularly the romanticized notions of the Old South, continue to be um, propelled. And that's troubling, and I think we do need to, to look at those really critically. So in 2015, the University of Alabama, which is the institution that I work at, um, said that they were gonna unveil a painting of his, our historic campus. So as an art historian who loves Antebellum South, I was very excited to see this painting. And it went up, it was huge. It was probably eight feet wide, a beautiful frame. It must have cost a fortune to commission. And they unveil it and it's a very romanticized, prettified, idyllic scene of um, an enslaved man driving students to campus while they wave goodbye to their students. and a man who you presume is enslaved because we know the University of Alabama owned slaves, professors brought their slaves to campus, and just the wrong-sidedness of the idealization that in the university's library shows you that, that um, you know, um, a lot of people still don't really understand it and why it's so important to learn about these images and about the history in general um, and why going to a plantation museum that doesn't address the role of enslaved people at that site and makes the Old South look seem so gone with the windish is, is a huge problem. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox there, but um, the great question, thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. There you go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was, uh, I guess, thinking a, think a lot of things, but thinking back to um, the previous person's question um, about how do we see this represented currently. Um, and as you stated, it's been in propaganda, rhetoric, 
um, being able to shape a particular argument to then shape society as a whole is a continuous cycle. Um, I teach language arts at the middle school level. So it's just at the very beginning of being able to understand how important it is um, to be able to articulate a point, argue it um, in a convincing manner. And I don't have a lot of opportunities to show how we can do that visually. It's usually about writing and bias and things like that, but uh, visual representation does the same thing as an argumentative essay. So I just appreciate you for giving me uh, just something different to um, present to my students. And if you could email me this, I don't know if it has any proprietary stuff going I'd on. I'd be happy to share it widely yeah, and broadly. I would, okay, I would love to um, just give my students something else to consider. Um, and and then maybe this is going off on a little tangent, but I don't know much about art in this way, but if we take media clips, uh, social media, news reports, it's, it, that's, that's what this is. It's all propaganda, how they're gonna present something, how they're gonna make you think about a suspect even before that suspect has been tried. And you, we can go on and on, Central Park Five, or when they see us with just release. So we could just, we could just always talk about this in our communities, in our classroom, in our churches. Um, oh, and I did find it interesting that after the Civil War, these same images, these same paintings of slaves being loyal and docile and childlike, now all of a sudden they were sexual deviants. Um, they were murderous, they were angry, um, and it's all just to prove a point at the end of the day. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, absolutely. I agree with what you say, and thank you so much for your work as a teacher. It's so important, and so I, I definitely appreciate that. And I'm reaping the benefits of your teaching because hopefully by the time they get to me, they can write an argumentative essay. <laughs> um, but some, most of them can at the college level, <laughs> or at least they can learn it really quickly if they, if they haven't gotten that in the, in the past. But... Um, I do think it's important to acknowledge, and that's why I use that word interdisciplinary at the end of my um, talk, because it's not, the art didn't exist in a vacuum. The, the rhetoric and the writing and the politics and the debates and the, the literature, it was all there together and kind of working together. And so it's really hard for us to get a good grasp. It's really hard for me as a person who was trained in, in, in analyzing art to really understand the, how interconnectedness of everything um, in the antebellum period, but, but I, I agree with you that intermedia, using lots of different angles, not only to teach your students, but to, to learn about the, um, the propaganda, as you say, is, 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 is super important. And that's why when I started this project and I saw that there was a lot of of cover up of this kind of stuff, or just, um, you know, a lot of the images I showed you today probably weren't super familiar to you, just because there hasn't been a lot written about, about the um, pro-South antebellum art, about Southern art in general, especially historical Southern art. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but the problematic nature is one of them, but um, the, the need to sort of move on and the desire for the country to so-called unite after the Civil War and recover it just forced all this information away. And so a lot of my work has just been trying to recover it and learn about it and put it all together to, to, sh to show a point. But So thank you for your comment. Thank you. He's asking me how, how I put this together since so little is known about it. Where, where do we get this information? Where did I find it? And um, how, did I, how did I research it? It was a, a bit of a, a, I don't know, scavenger hunt, hunt and peck operation for me. There was no manual on how to find it all. Um, so I just did the best I could. I, um, I started on the internet, as one does. So I started, I spent probably almost an entire summer looking at the websites of repositories of information, historical societies, museums, archives, libraries like this library. 
other places, just scouring to see what they had and what was available. Some places have stuff online and a lot, a lot of their collections digitized, other places don't. So after I'd sort of built this constellation of images, then I started going to places that I thought might have more um, experts um, on site to talk to. So I've found that it's always super useful to go to places. One place I've been that's been very helpful is the Virginia Historical Society. I haven't been to the Georgia Historical Society yet, and I probably should, but the Virginia one is typical in that it's very large, it has lots of historic material, and has lots of specialists who know what they have. So I go and find those specialists because I don't know what they have, and they probably know, um, have an idea of things in their collection that would suit my project that I don't even know about, and then might not even be digitized. So it was a whole series of internet research, then a lot of travel, going to places and talking to people in person and saying, this is what I'm doing, does this ring a bell for you for anything? And then, um, then trying to put it all together from there. This one, I, it was just through a conversation with a colleague who knew about this image when I was talking to her about my project and I try, I try to talk, if people are curious and they ask me about the project, I wanna talk to them because people know things and they can, they can um, mention things that I haven't, haven't seen yet. So this, um, she had seen this somewhere, like in the American Antiquarian Society when she was doing work. And she thought, you might want to look at this because that might, that might fit somehow. And it interestingly does just because it's interesting that it was never made as a print. And so that to me spoke of some sort of cover up and I started to think about why that, why that was. So um, it was a process. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you. I don't know that I know the eye. Let me look at that. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question that I actually don't know the answer to. Does anyone have any thoughts? That's what I, I would tend to think. However, um, I can't tell you for sure if Beecher is a Mason, but you would, th the, Masons, the Masons as a general group are neither anti-slavery or pro-slavery. Doesn't it kind of depend on where their group is? Is that true? So, mm -hmm. but so, yeah, Andrew Jackson, a lot of the early presidents are. Um, I would love to find that out for you. I will research it, um, and if I can get your contact information, I'll follow up. I hate that I don't have the answer today. Thank you. Okay, please. so-called civilized that person? Well, she's, she's trying to make a um, connection. I think everybody heard you. I won't try to repeat what she said, but, but 
the um, I'm not a historian of Christianity, but from what I've read about um, Christianity and slavery, this was th this could have potentially been um, a problem for slave owners to be enslaving other people, according to the Bible. And certainly both anti-slavery and pro-slavery sides looked to the Bible for defense. They picked and picked and chose what suited their purposes. And so throughout the course of slavery in the antebellum South, the ways that, that Christianity was used sort of shifted and varied in an individual way. Some um, so-called benevolent slave owners sought to baptize and Christianize their enslaved people as part of their so-called moral duty. Others did not do that. It sort of depended on the time and place and belief of the owner and the situation on that particular plantation. However, we do see again and again the Christian justification that uh, of taking a so-called savage African and Christianizing them as one of the justifications for slavery. So, so I don't know that it's too far of a stretch to, if you put that in modern day terms, to think about uh, about what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. It could be, and I will say, so if you didn't hear her, she said, perhaps the eye here is poking fun at the black masons or thinking about black masonry in a satirical way, which certainly would fit with what Valk, the artist, was doing. He was, he was, had biting satirical uses of humor. He was very smart, and he was very self-educated and knowledgeable about about aspects of everything and he included those little clues in his work which is hard for why it's hard for me to get at all the intentions of everything he included in all of his works so it wouldn't surprise me if he knew about the black masons if he used it if he was using that to poke fun at, at um, Beecher thank you yes ma'am That's hard. I mean, you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, willful ignorance is, is a thing, and <laughs> and um, it's really hard to get at people's psychology, and it's also, um, if you're me, you want, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, however, um, and to think optimistically, however, um, I know that change is very slow to come, and I know that generational attitudes, particularly among maybe old upper classes in the South, are very slow to change. I mean, you learn from whoever raises you, and so, so ignorance, will for ignorance, or purposeful um, r romanticization of this stuff. Um, I don't, it's hard to kind of distinguish between those, but um, I've been 
a side project, and that's why I brought up the plantation museums, because I spent the summer touring around to public museums that have sites of slavery, um, because I wanted to see how that was being presented to the public. So I wanted to take the tour just as a general member of the public, um, just to see what they said. And I went to about 35 different places from D.C. to Louisiana, all, all over. And I tell you some places are so what I, what I consider forward thinking in terms of talking about the root of the money and introducing the tour by saying, you see all this? You know why this was possible? We're not trying to cover up who we were. We want you to know and we want to celebrate and this is a learning process and you know there's there's a lot of tours that start in the kitchen for example and talk about the daily life of the cook because often they know a lot about the cook for some reason she appears he or she appears in records and we have names and things so there are certainly places doing that and there are certainly places that you don't even unless i knew there was slave quarters or sites of, of slave habitation at that site i never heard the word slave and sometimes I heard the word servant which was even possibly more offensive or misleading and so those sites certainly do know and aren't approaching the public with the information they know and so I think that that sort of illustrates that there's a broad spectrum and um, education is the key and as much as we can talk to people and have conversation about this I think that might be the best tactic that's what I'm trying to do anyway. That's a really good question because I can have all the visual evidence and as an art historian I, I lean on visual, but it's always good when you can have the words of the owner saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to commission this work because I want to make my plantation look happy so that I, because I support slavery. And I don't have, there just aren't, I haven't found a diary that says that, for example. But what I have found, and I can't cite any specifics off the top of my head, but what I have found to be true is that generally the people that were commissioning, let's take these plantation paintings, for example, they were A, the wealthiest of the wealthiest. Many of them were politically involved. Many in the South of the people that owned the most numbers of slaves and therefore had the most capital were involved in local politics and therefore were most deeply invested in maintaining their power, which was through their money, which was through the institution of slavery. So, so the, the ideas are there. I don't have a specific quote that shows it. Yes, sir. Were you able to find out if some of the artists that were working at that time went on to do uh, work in the black community? After, I was born in the black community. Did you work with any of them? Who came out after you? Were they caricatures of African Americans? That's a really, really insightful question, and the answer is yes. So those, um, that cohort of Richmond artists that I mentioned, they um, were, there was a group of young, white, wealthy Richmond artists who were working together during the years of the Civil War and who had trained elsewhere. Many of them had gone to Europe. They were from wealthy families, gone to Europe, gone to study in New York. But then when the war broke out, they all returned home because they were good old Virginia boys. And they, many of them joined the Confederacy. Many of them served the Confederacy as artists, either map makers, um, sending correspondence like drawings uh, and prints and things back to publications and in various capacities and continuing to do things like William Washington did in making that burial of Watane painting. And then some, you know, each individual artist story is different. A handful of them were killed in the war, but there is a handful of them who were very young during the war who went on to work as illustrators and um, 
printmakers and um, magazine illustrators and others to, who promoted those that romanticized notion of the Old South. So I think his name is William Ludwell Shepard. I showed that Master Charlie image that he did, the carrying the body home. He's one in particular that went on to be a very well-known illustrator nationally of Southern sympathy. So um, he propelled his sort of pro-slavery images directly into a very lucrative career nationally that supported the same notions. And out of those images and out of those types of images, that national romanticized notion of the Old South developed. So, so yes, exactly. And I, I wanna continue my story. I, I'm stopping my story at 1865 because there's just so much there. And there, but there's, none of that stuff stops. It just all keeps going and some of it changes form, just like history in other ways. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're dark back there. Yes. To me, the greatest hypocrisy among many, many hypocrisies of this slavery justification rhetoric and art is that it's unjustifiable that it's obvious that if they're running away, they do not consider themselves part of the family. And in fact, in fact, if they're running away, they are taking their life in their own hands they are usually leaving their family behind often. Um, their situation is so dire that they're willing to do that. And so they're so valuable, these people, that their owners, the same ones that are in politics and that are commissioning paintings like this and that are painting the rosy picture are taking out runaway slave ads. So to me, there's no more powerful kind of like eye opener than to put the happy plantation picture next to just a handful of the clippings that that individual ads that that individual man might have taken out in the local newspaper after his so-called happy family de deserted him. So that's also so insightful to you because that just shows me it's a, it's a cover up. It is propaganda. Yes, ma'am. I'm really glad to hear you say that because this is just one of the many complications of thinking about and talking about and studying slavery because certainly there were scenarios in which there were genuine bonds. Um, bonds granted that could be severed at any moment by um, the property owner, but um, it's really hard to probe that idea. How do you get into the psychology of that? And then for me, how do I, I mean, I don't want to make any apologies. And so it's even hard to, to kind of think that or tr even try to get at that notion. Because especially, for example, when I've gone on these um, tours, when you start hearing the word benevolent slave owner from the tour guide or things along those lines, you know, I am automatically get pretty upset. And I try to listen and think about their evidence and, all that, but even so, the bottom line to me is is that th that this is this is a property transaction that could be severed at any time. But how can we still be sympathetic to those those emotional attachments that were inevitable in some cases, especially? So it's 
I don't know that anyone's really thinking about that. I mean, really making a historical argument about that. Um, but it is, it is something that I'm certainly grappling with. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, embarrassingly, that, that idea hasn't crossed my mind, and it certainly should have, um, because often the people giving the tours on, if on that project, the archivists and librarians I'm talking to, are white almost exclusively. And so I got to say I take them a little off guard when I ask them what I'm asking them because they don't expect me to come in asking for that. I I know. Did y'all hear what she asked? She said, how do I think my my being white and going to an archive and asking to look at what they have with, about the history of slavery or visual culture of slavery and all that, how do you think that would be different if an African American person asked for the same thing? That's such a, a deep question that it's really hard. I, what do you, do you have an idea? Yeah. I see. I just don't know. But I will say, not all boxes and, o- and doors have been open to me because this is information that's delicate and it has taken a lot of relationship building with institutions to get to see some things. Um, And I don't know if maybe they would have never been shown to someone else, but I particularly encountered a lot of problem in Richmond. I've done a lot of research in Richmond And they tend to hold their history very close. The Valentine, sorry, Paul, anybody out here, they've been wonderful and it's taken time. (laughs) But there are, um, the institutions there, the institutions there tend to make it difficult for the researcher. Um, Which I just go and I think, we need this information. This is is so significant and important to progress. And I just am flabbergasted that historian, I mean, that librarians and archives sometimes don't always want to share. They are the stewards of this very important information. And I just, yeah, um, m- many of them are very willing to share, at least with me. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Is there some kind of debate over that, over how particular some certain scholars or people that the public are even talking about? Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. That's it's a really good point because um, my training is, and my comfort zone is is sitting at the desk reading those documents and looking at that work and and writing about it. And I'm totally out of my element when it comes to 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 making it publicly approachable, to making it relevant, and to talking to the public about it. Um, but that is critical, and I have, I tell myself this all the time, we historians of the antebellum period have to force ourselves out of the office, at, and from, out from behind the desk, because we can actually share um, what we've learned, and it is of great relevance in educating the general public, and so I don't really know how to do that particularly I'm working on it in terms of is it writing educational op-eds for newspapers or editorials is it publishing in more public magazines rather than scholarly journals um, I don't know is uh, exactly how that looks but I think historians it is important for historians to take on more of a public role um, but I also think the onus is kind of on all of us to just share and have these discussions. Um, but certainly, um, your call to 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 public to, to, for historians to go public, I think, is is being heard and felt by a lot of people, especially especially people who think about the antebellum South and who have a body of knowledge about it. Yes, ma'am. So if you guys didn't hear, she's asking why they even wanted to do this. Why did the slave owners feel compelled or feel that it was necessary to project this romanticized notion of the plantation? And I think it's actually a little bit complicated because you're right to wonder that because it's not like slavery was hidden. There was lots of things concealed, like I mentioned, but everyone knew who was a slave owner and who was supporting slavery. And some were quite proud of that, and it wasn't actually something that was all hush-hush. Certain things in navigating uh, um, interactions between enslaved people and what actually went on in the plantation, many of, much of that was kept under wraps. But I think ultimately it, went it comes down to the pressure that the South was feeling from the abolitionists. So abolitionists, primarily in the North and almost exclusively exclusively in the North after the 1840s. Many of them were kind of run out of the South. If you're, it's hard to be an abolitionist living in the South. Um, are gaining political momentum. They're gaining power. Um, and they are threatening to destroy. So slave owners feel under threat and under attack um, uh, in terms of destroying the institution. They're trying to destroy the institution. So the slave owners are under attack. So they're feeling the need to hang on tightly to slave ownership because I think it all boils down to money. That is the root of their um, wealth and of the economic system in the South. And, and so um, they're gonna use their political power and all the things around that, which is art is included in that, to help justify it. And right around the time that abolitionism, abolitionism gets so organized and kind of heavy handed in the 1830s, that's the same time that these justifications start coming out more and more strongly as well. Earlier in the 19th century, slavery was known as the necessary evil, and it became, it, the, the, the um, justification sort of switched to it being a so-called positive good around the 1830s, right at the same time the abolitionists are showing the evils of slavery. So, so oh, oh, actually it's not evil at all, it's a, it's a good thing, and so let's justify that in response. And so I think all of this comes about as a response to abolitionism. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you. There is one, the Southern, oh, what's it called? Illustrated London News. It was an illustrated paper in London that was very pro-South. And we had less illustrated newspapers in the South, particularly during the Civil War because of the c financial constraints. Um, so there was this major one in, in London, the Illustrated London News, that was totally pro-South and where we see, you see things in there that you would just assume were coming out of the South. And that continued after the war, too. Yes, ma'am. I know, it's hard to say. I'm trying to live in my pre-1865 bubble because there's so much material, but of course you still see things all, all the time. Um, uh, I, forgot, I forgot where I was headed there, but um, I gotta say that there's a lot of museums around the country that are doing really amazing things with um, artists, particularly black artists, and in, in, in trying to collect black artists' work who are responding to this stuff and who are actually un, you know, kind of like taking the veil off of it and calling it out. There are lots of different artists that are, that are doing this. And so when I'm at a museum and I see contemporary art, particularly black art, I, I go to the stuff that's about the exposure rather than the cover-up, if you know what I'm saying. So I can't, say, I can't really answer that question very well for you, just because I try to stay away, and that's not that's not the way to do it. And it's certainly there, but um, but there is a lot that's counteracting that too. A lot of energy that direction as well. Okay, I'll have a short answer. Okay, so I don't know technology very well. If it was streamed live on Facebook, um, can can they go back? Can you go back and watch it later? So if you check the Facebook page of Auburn Avenue or Baton Foundation, Auburn Avenue Research Library, you should be able to watch the video. If anybody would like a script, I will happily email it to you. If you just didn't catch something and want to read a little of my script, just email me. Um, I'd be happy to share it. This is all information that I've learned and I'm happy to share. Same thing with the images. The image um, PowerPoint would be harder to email because it's such high resolution, but I could figure out a way to digitally translate that to you as well. In terms of the cutting of the, the diaries, um, I'm trying to get the court case and I'm not having a lot of luck seeing the transcript of the court case that says why the decision um, came down that way, but what I have seen is the wills of Edward Valentine, the sculptor who wrote the books, and he had a will, he was very wealthy, so he had a will and lived to be into his 90s. So for the last like seven decades, he would redo his will regularly, shift his money around, give different things to different people and different groups. One thing that stayed the same in every single diary was the statement that all of my diaries must be destroyed upon my death. He did not say why, but I like to think it's because it had a lot of private and personal information in there, particularly with regard to his feelings about race, to his slave ownership, and he was a slave owner as well, and to 
uh, and maybe it was just gossip stuff. I mean, I don't really know, but because of his like integration in the Old South mentality of Richmond and the group he was in and the sort of racist activities that him and his family members engaged in, I like to think he wanted them destroyed because they would have exposed him for posterity in a very negative way. Now, why did his family want to keep them? Probably because he was very famous. He had, 50, this is 50 years of archives, records for their family. Maybe they thought they could keep them private. So why the judge said half a page, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> but um, I've looked at them. It's, I haven't, I wasn't willing to spend the hours that it takes to maybe kind of decipher some sentences, um, particularly because you have to pay by the hour to look at these particular books. And so I didn't go there with, you know, 10 hours to spare. Um, but, but it's definitely, it's an intriguing thing, for sure. I'm glad you brought it up. I've talked way too long and way too much. I appreciate you all for all your questions and your attention. And thanks again for coming and for staying. Thank you. Thank you so much, you. Rachel. Wow. You guys are good. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. Uh, thank you all. One of one of the things that I frequently tell um, folks I randomly send emails to is that you will really enjoy our audience. Um, it is just such a pleasure. It really is. I uh, did my graduate work in museum education back in the early '90s, and I've been around a lot of museum talks and lectures and, and all of that stuff. In fact, the Maryland Historical Society, where you see the eye that you guys were talking about, that was my first museum that I worked at up in Baltimore, um, right out of graduate school. Uh, so I've been around the museum field for a long time. And you just don't get to see audiences like you guys. Um, you just don't always see it. So I appreciate you for uh, your input, for making this a real dynamic lecture today. And thank you, Rachel, for your generosity and for really presenting information that I think is helpful. And you were, you know, one of the questions, of course, was how do we get, how do historians get this information out to the public? And certainly there are the journals and the editorial that you mentioned, but this is another way. And this is exactly why we do this. Because folks like Rachel are buried away somewhere in some library or some college somewhere. Um, so they don't get to meet folks like you often. And we certainly, myself included, are not always at universities and libraries. Um, but I will tell you this, as a museum professional, uh, it's been a long time coming. And the kinds of things that Rachel was talking about regarding historic sites, it is real. And I remember having these conversations both in graduate school and certainly when I started my career uh, about what can museums do. And, um, you know, to me, I might have been a little um, naive, but it just seemed so simple. It really seemed simple to tell the truth. It wasn't until much later in my life um, that I realized that the truth is very political. I didn't know that when I was in graduate school. I know it now. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to stop fighting um, because this information is real. This history in this country is real and it impacts every single thing that happens today. Every single thing. Rachel and I were talking before the lecture uh, and I said to her, and I believe this firmly, the country and folks, black and white, want to believe that things have changed. Well, the country has not changed. This is the same country it always has been. There's been a lot of window dressing um, that's been changed out. The decor is different, but the foundation is rock solid. Were that not true, we couldn't see what we see today. It would be impossible. If this were a different country, we absolutely would not be able to see today the kinds of things that we see. So. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being interested Thank in you. this information. Uh, if you go to the website, thebatonfoundation.org, we have the programs for next month up already, including the documentary about Toni Morrison that came out in June. 
that's on September 8th. Um, so check us out, and hopefully we'll see you back here. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you.